and welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast, a podcast that is absolutely committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people directly to your earbuds. And today I have a guest who's a hero of mine. I've known him for a long time. I've done a lot of podcasts with him. And and this podcast is on, well, let me just introduce it quickly. It's the 20th anniversary edition of the Privileged Planet. Uh, we've talked about the Privileged Planet on this podcast before, but this is a very important update. And of course, uh, Jay answers the question as to whether or not Earth is a privileged planet. You know, there are some scientists who are speculating uh, that the Earth is merely an insignificant speck of soil that is aimlessly adrift in a meaningless universe. But evidence, and you'll hear that evidence today, refutes the principle of mediocrity. And instead, it demonstrates that our Earth, well, it's singularly privileged. And it's a planet that is designed for discovery. And Jay gives a lot of reasons for that. And I'll formally introduce him in just a moment. I'll even mention his last name. Um, but, but, but the first of those reasons is that there are unique conditions that are necessary to support intelligent life. And they turn out to provide the best overall conditions for scientific discovery. A second reason and I put this in a memorable format in, in one of my books, but the, the second reason is that we live in the best overall age of the universe. Think about that, the best overall age of the universe to do cosmology. In our time, the cosmic background radiation that is left over from the Big Bang is readily observable. But here's the key, it won't always be like that. And that radiation confirms that the universe is not eternal, but it began in the finite past. And let me give you one more reason. I like to do things in threes. Uh, from habitability to discoverability, and these are two key words in this book. From habitability to discoverability, Earth's status in the universe is surely, absolutely, beyond a doubt, one of privilege. And if you were to reduce that to an accident of cosmic evolution, you would be, you would be short-sighted. But if you recognize it as privileged, well, that's sublime. And that's precisely why this book is titled The Privileged Planet. Uh, and, and, and it is one of my favorite books. And, and this is the 20th anniversary edition. And it has many additions to it that are, are, are important. So this is a book that you can get on the web at equip.org. You can write me at post office box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. It's for those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. Well, let me uh, give you Jay's last name. Uh, if you followed the podcast, you already know what his last name is. It's Richards, J. W. Richards. And he is director of the DeVos Center for Life, Religion, and family at the Heritage Foundation. He's a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute, and he's the executive editor of The Stream. Now, Jay is incredibly credentialed. If I went over all of his credentials, it would take a while, but he is a, a, a PhD in philosophy and theology from Princeton Theological Seminary, uh, among other things. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the other things. Uh, he's contributed to many articles in the Christian Research Journal, and he's the author of 14 incredible books. Maybe it's more by now. Maybe it's 15. I don't know. 14 or 15 incredible books, including the New York Times bestsellers, uh, Infiltrated and Indivisible, and a book titled Money, Greed, and God, which was one of my favorites. It also won a 210 a 2010 Templeton Enterprise Award. 
He wrote a book that I followed uh, religiously for a long period of time, but I don't anymore. I, I need to get back to, when I'm looking at Jay, I'm thinking I need to get back to this book. It's titled Eat, Fast, and Feast. And then a book that is incredibly relevant to this age. It's titled The Human Advantage, The Future of American Work in an Age of Smart Machines. I mean, that that's an incredible book. And I, I, I want to ask Jay a question about that in just a moment. But the book that we're talking about today is The Privileged Planet. And uh, we're going to focus on that remarkable work. It's just come out uh, not long ago on the updated, revised uh, format. And so, Jay, as always, I love having you on the podcast. And you are one of my heroes. You are you're someone that not only... Uh, does incredible writing and speaking, but you, you, you do the research that's necessary to be able to demonstrate that what you're talking about is not your own vivid predilections, but it is, it is faith founded on a refutable fact. So thanks for being on the podcast again. Oh, thank you, Hank. It's so great to be with you. So fun. I mean, we probably talked about the book 20 years ago, which is kind of scary to think. But, you know, Guillermo Gonzalez and I, when we we uh, were writing it, we actually realized, okay, the book's coming out in 2004. There's going to be a total solar eclipse in the U.S. in 2024. So maybe we'll do a 20th year anniversary edition and we'll update it. But of course, that's something you, you tell yourself. And then it, that's actually what happened. And one of the most important things that I learned in the process was that you're a lot better writer 20 years older. <laughs> it's because of, when you read it, it's like, gosh, I've, you know, I've spent 20 years writing and trying to translate stuff for broader and broader audiences. And so what we thought would just be an update and some references uh, ended up really being a rewrite, not to change the argument, but just to hopefully make it more accessible. And, and also to update it based on, Absolutely. yeah, uh, just just an incredible uh, piece of work. Um, before we get into the privileged planet, I, I did want to ask you a quick question on the human advantage. We're going to be in sure. Athens in, in a month's yes. time. And uh, in this book, you talk about the future of American work in an age of smart machines. A lot of people mm -hmm. think that it is possible for machines to replace human beings. You make right. the argument in that book that that will never happen. Why? Right. Because we're not uh, machines. That's the simple answer. And so for something to entirely replace us, they would have to be everything that, that we are. Um, now, you might say, well, OK, but the, the things we do that are machine-like um, that has everything to do with our work. And so therefore the meaningful work that we do uh, will ultimately be replaced by machines. Um, and so part of this is a metaphysical claim, right? But part of it is a kind of empirical claim. Um, and so when I wrote the book, it came out in 2018, I wanted to give the other side as much credit as possible. And so, so in other words, I basically said, okay, let's assume that anything that can be automated uh, using a combination of AI and robotics will be automated. Moreover, let's assume that that's going to happen in our lifetimes. What does that mean? And the book's really, uh, though there's a lot of philosophy in it, it's really designed to say, okay, if that happens, here's what you need to do to prepare. And my argument is that, in fact, machines will do a lot of stuff that humans are doing right now, but there's a lot of other stuff that they won't do. And as long as we pivot to the things that are uniquely human, uh, we will be able to do profound things, important things uh, that are meaningful, that are work. Um, it's just that it will look different than what it looks like now, just as the way we farm now looks different than the way it looked 100 or 200 or 500 years ago or the way we write. Um, if technology permanently replaced people, that is, it permanently uh, created massive unemployment, all of human history would be this really depressing story of more and more people finding that they don't have anything to do, but that's not what happens at all. Um, in different technological stages, what that does is maybe something that we need a lot of labor for at an earlier period, um, we're able to automate or develop machines so that you know it only takes five people to do what it took 5,000 people to do at a previous era. That doesn't mean there's nothing left to do. It means that you know we're creatures made in the image of the creative God. We find new, and important and hopefully dignifying things to do that presuppose all the technology that sort of went before us. And so there's a, a bit of metaphysics in this. What are humans? Or can we be reduced to machines? There's a good bit of economics. And then there's also some predictions about what I thought 
was and was not going to happen. Um, and I thought, for instance, that long haul, automated long haul trucks, that would be easier to pull off uh, than say a housekeeper that's entirely robotic because that involves complex movement uh, through space. I'd say the biggest surprise is probably how powerful these chatbots, so-called large language models are, um, how, how good they are. But it, it, it's, it doesn't prove that we're machines. It doesn't mean these things are gonna become conscious. It just means that we're able to develop systems that can call and sort and run probabilities on all the intelligent choices that we make. And so everything you see in Claude or in chat GPT-4 is it the self, it's itself the result of human intelligence and the data it's trained on is uh, all information that's the result of human intelligence. And so I just think that's the kind of fundamental reality. And the nice thing is it's, there's this metaphysical claim that transhumanists make that machines will surpass us. The best we can do is upload ourselves to the machines. Um, they give specific dates. And so I said, okay, great. Let, let's make some empirical claims and see who's right and who's wrong about this stuff. Yeah. So what about the panpsychism, the idea that somehow or other there's a materialistic way in which you can explain consciousness? Yeah, it seems so strange to me because, um, of course, as you said, panpsychism, in some ways, that would be the philosophically consistent way that transhumanists could sort of do this, that every bit of matter you know, sort of has a little consciousness in it. And when you combine it into larger and larger structures, like a human, right, we're made up of all sorts of different cells, uh, that then there's kind of this emergent consciousness for matter. Um, that's an interesting argument. I don't think it finally it really works because we all pretty much, we recognize that there's just the constituents of matter are not themselves agents in the ways that humans or even say animals are. Um, but what's interesting is that almost all the transhumanists don't go that route. They're not panpsychists, they're not pantheists, they're materialists. And so you get someone like Ray Kurzweil, who in a sense really believes that we're machines. And so he thinks, look, you get computers working fast enough and sophisticated enough, they really can become everything we are. Um, and then you say, okay, well, so what are you talking about? What about our consciousness? What about our agency? What about our, the fact that we're persons? And he will either say, well, that's something that can be uploaded by which he ends up meaning a brain pattern. Or he says, well, who's to say that we're conscious? Maybe we're just, that's an illusion or something, which to me is, okay, you're making an argument that our consciousness and agency is an illusion. That's a pretty good argument that whatever you're thinking <laughs> is, is seriously wrong, right? If that's your conclusion, uh, I doubt your premise. But that's the kind of dilemma. If you're a committed materialist, um, you, you're sort of stuck because it's not like you could say, well, I believe that humans are a, a unique hybrid of body and soul and the soul can somehow be detached from the body and uploaded. They never appeal to that. So they're never going to deal to a Christian anthropology. They never really even appeal to panpsychism. They're just materialists and they're inconsistent. And I think the reason they're inconsistent is because all of us, no matter what our kind of metaphysical views, if in fact human beings are this unique, uh, uh, we're unique creatures that are the dust of the earth and the, the breath of God, we are fully human and are fully material, fully spiritual at the same time. If your anthropology doesn't get that right, um, then you're going to go off the rails somewhere, but you're never ultimately going to be able to deny it. So even the materialist who really doesn't have a basis for believing he has freedom or agency or consciousness, nevertheless presupposes it when he's not thinking about it. And so he ends up being inconsistent. And so materialists almost always end up kind of metaphysically schizophrenic, which is what I think you have. You certainly have this in transhumanism. You have it in gender ideology, where the person is treated as a kind of disembodied gender soul that might get stuck in the wrong body. Um, all these attempts to kind of account for humanity, but without getting the, the Christian and the biblical understanding of the richness of what the human person is. If you don't get that, you still have to be confronted by it because you are yourself a human person in all of its fullness. Uh, but, but your metaphysic doesn't really and can't really account for it. Yeah, um, I want to get right to the privileged planet Um you know, we, we, we did do the first podcast on this, I think, or, or broadcast on this back in 2004, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I had hair back then. You still have hair 20 years <laughs> later. Um, but what is the privileged planet hypothesis? Mm -hmm. You summarized it. It's basically, here's the claim, is that those rare places in the universe where life can exist, that is, the, 
The most habitable places in the universe are also the best places overall for doing science, for scientific discovery. So observers, complex observers like ourselves, find themselves in the best places overall for observing. And so this is, you know, multiple parts of this argument are required. The first is this whole idea of habitability, that not just any old place is going to be good for life. Almost everything we learn and everything, frankly, we've learned since in the last 20 years, um, I think shows that you got to get a lot of stuff at the local level uh, that is the kind of level of the pl of planetary system just right in order to have a planet that can even host life. We're not even talking about life itself. We're just talking about a planet in which life can, can exist and persist. And so that's interesting on its own. Um, but you could ask this other question, okay, if you were, if you needed to do science, you needed to discover whether the universe had a beginning, that's got to be the biggest question, uh, how old the universe is, how it works, what the stars are, what the world is made of, what fundamental principles govern the movements of, uh, of matter, all these kinds of questions you need to ask, you know, if you're going to do science, and then you say, okay, and you can pick only one place to be, where would that be? And, and you run the analysis and what you discover is the best place to be is the one place where life can exist. That's an astonishing discovery. It's one thing to say that habitable planets are very rare in the universe. It's another thing to say that there's this pervasive pattern in which the, the things you need to build a habitable planet also set that planet up for doing science. And uh, science in that place can be done a lot better uh, than the less habitable places. And it's it's that coincidence, that combination of the needs for life and the needs for scientific discovery together that we think that that forms a strong design argument. It's like, okay, look, if the universe is designed for discovery, that's exactly what you would expect. If you're a, material, a materialist that thinks everything is the result of blind chance and necessity, this is just, there's really no explanation for it. It's just a weird brute fact that you can't account for. So yeah, maybe this isn't a deductive proof for God's existence, but it's a pretty darn strong uh, argument for design of the universe by an intelligence that transcends it. So explain what your argument is not, because a lot of critics mm -hmm. say that you're making the claim that Earth is unique and therefore it is designed. Yes. That's not really your argument, is it? Not at all. And in fact, um, in, the, whether Earth or Earth-like planets are common or rare in the universe um, is metaphysically ambiguous. I mean, put it this way. If there's a transcendent God, as we believe, um, God could create the universe in a lot of ways. He could have made it just our solar system with life on Earth. He could have made it where there's habitable planets everywhere. All, all those things are sort of possible for God. Um, and so it's not like theism entails either that life be rare or life be common. Um, and so just because you discover that, okay, we've got a really big universe, maybe uh, 10 to the 22 observable stars uh, in, in the, the, uh, the universe, the observable universe, that's a big place. A lot of potential planets around those stars. Um, it could be, for instance, if you're a materialist, you might say, okay, well, maybe it's just really, really hard to get the conditions for life, but in a universe that's large enough, one will happen to have the conditions that life needs. Like it's like a vast cosmic lottery. And in that one place, life will, you know, presumably evolve or appear. And that is kind of the materialist assumption. And so a materialist could be fine with life being rare in the universe, even though most materialists for some reason go the other way. They think, well, you know, whatever happened here must have happened countless times elsewhere because there's nothing special about the earth. That's the, that's the general kind of drift in the debate. Um, nevertheless, Guillermo Gonzalez and I say, look, really kind of metaphysically, it could go either way. And so we want to know empirically whether that's true or not. And so we just think that, that would be a bad argument to say, okay, well, gosh, it's Earth-like planets or habitable planets are really rare in the universe, therefore God had to do it, because that's um, just not a great argument. I mean, there's no, no way else to put it. But that is what people very often thought the argument was going to be, because it takes a bit of time to explain that, no, we're, we're, we're build, building argument on this remarkable coincidence of the needs for life and the needs for scientific discovery. We needed the rarity in order to see the pattern um, that, in fact, you know, compared to most of the other places and the other planets where uh, that, you, that we actually know exist, um, 
there's just a few that actually made only one that we know of so far that that can possibly host life. And so it's very interesting to discover that those very rare places are also the best places for doing science. Yeah. So your argument is about uh, about the fact that Earth is is habitable. And it's also a perfect place for scientific discovery. That's right. Yeah. Or perfect in the sense that it's the, the best Ideal. sort of condition. Yeah. If you think of these things, as, there's lots of trade-offs, of course, that have to be made. So um, the best overall place, like if you, in other words, if you can only pick one place and you need to know things, say, about the recent past, um, you'd need to know things about the distant past, you need to know some stuff about physics, whether the universe had a beginning, all these kinds of things. Turns out there, you got there's complicated trade-offs because there's kind of competing conditions. So, for instance, if all you wanted to do is discover the back, background radiation, okay, well, the best place to detect that would be between galaxies, probably in intergalactic space. But you you would optimize your sit situation to discover that one thing. That would be a terrible place to discover the laws of gravity or what happened in the recent past or to do chemistry. Um, and so what you want is to optimize for all these kinds of competing conditions. And when you get that, then that's the argument that in fact, what you get is an Earth-like planet. You get the, the, the planet that we have. We can't prove that there aren't Earth -like, other Earth-like planets in the universe. We really don't have enough evidence one way or the other, but we can make a prediction that if we're right, if there are other Earth-like planets in the universe, they will be very, 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 much like the Earth. They will have moons and suns very much like ours. They'll have perfect solar eclipses like we enjoy. And so that's actually a prediction of our argument. Uh, we don't predict you'll never find an Earth-like planet. We say, if you find one, it will be very much like the Earth. So it'd be an Earth twin. Yeah, it'd be an Earth twin. In fact, Guillermo says if we ever get uh, detect a radio transmission, for instance, from some other intelligent civilization, um, the first thing we should do is send them uh, digital copies of our pictures of our best solar eclipse pictures and ask them to send us some of theirs. Uh, I want to quote your favorite astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah. uh, who is an evangelist for mm -hmm. our insignificance. Mm -hmm. uh, you believe in our significance. He believes in our insignificance. And he actually says this, and you quote this in the book, every advance in our knowledge of the cosmos has revealed that we live on a cosmic speck of dust orbiting a mediocre star in the far suburbs of a, of a common sort of galaxy, a common sort of galaxy, among a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. The news of our cosmic unimportance triggers impressive defense mechanisms in the human psyche. So he's basically talking about the uh, Copernican principle, yes. uh, the principle of mediocrity. That's right. Yeah. And, and so Neil deGrasse Tyson is the kind of our, our generation's current incarnation of Carl Sagan, whom we, of course, also quote in the book. Uh, and Carl Sagan, who's since deceased, was the science popularizer that, that said this. In fact, he wrote a book called Pale Blue Dot, in which he said, we don't hold a privileged position in the universe. DeGrasse Tyson says the same thing. Of course, notice the kind of evaluative judgments here. So he, he says that we're in some unassuming suburb in the galaxy. Well, okay, so the obvious question is, where would you want to be in the galaxy? Okay, so we're in a large uh, spiral galaxy, which we call the Milky Way. So where would be the best spot to be? Um, and you say, okay, best for what? Well, how about best for life? That's really the interesting thing, right? We know that. Well, the last place you'd want to be is the center of the galaxy. It probably has a giant black hole. There's all this X-ray and gamma radiation. You've got stars popping off and getting sucked in. It's the most hostile place in the galaxy. If you're in the outer part of the solar system, there's, it's mostly hydrogen and helium. There's not even enough to sort of heavy materials to build Earth-like planets. If you're inside a spiral arm, uh, you're going to have there's, it's, that's also much riskier because of star formation. Where you'd want to be, as it turns out, when you study all the conditions for what you need in a galaxy, so the so-called galactic habitable zone, is midway out between the center and the edge of the galaxy, between spiral arms and rotating at about the same speed as the spiral arms. Guess where we are? We're exactly there. We're right in the sweet spot of the galactic habitable zone. And so for the thing you would be interested in, we're in 
prime location. It's only by, um, you know, sort of sleight of hand implying that, well, we're not in the center of the, the galaxy or something, that anyone could be tricked by that. What does it mean for our star to be ordinary? First of all, it's not true. Most of the stars of the galaxy are uh, these uh, red M dwarf stars. Our star is quite stable. Um, it's a single star, so it's not a binary or triplet system. Uh, again, for life, uh, this is exactly what you'd want. And so you just add up, I and mean, we could go through a list of about 30 of these things, and the stuff that he considers insignificant, clearly or not. It's only by he's sort of assuming the ignorance of his audience as to the details so that they'll just kind of get the ambiance that, well, yeah, it is a big universe, and we don't, you know, it doesn't look like an interesting place to be in the galaxy. And so it's, it's really a kind of surface level analysis. Um, assuming that people are just sort of stupefied by the size of the universe or something like that. But again, notice that the folks that say, well, we're insignificant because we're small relative to the universe, they never do the opposite. They never say, well, we're, on the other hand, we're really significant compared to the size of elementary particles, <laughs> quarks, right? I mean, you could, you could argue that. But of course, physical size and significance are just two different things. That's we're not going to answer the question one way or the other with that. Um, and and the details are going to be subtler. And if the you know that's what I actually think. If the universe is created by God, it is a book meant to be read. Expect it to be subtle, so that people that are open to the evidence, open to being able to read it and to understand its meaning, can detect that. But if you want these kind of superficial stories, like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson tells, well. God gives you the freedom to be able to believe those, but it, it really is a superficial treatment. Yeah, and that really gets to a point that I want to drive home, if you would. Um, people like uh, Tyson, they make these dogmatic assertions, not defensible arguments. And, and, and I think today people no longer think, mm -hmm. uh, they no longer ponder they yes. no longer examine. Uh, it, we're, we're hit by so much information, information mm -hmm. overload that we can't process it. And I'm wondering, uh, even as the father of many children, how do you inoculate people that really don't have an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to think through these things as you have? I mean, obviously, this is one of the reasons you wrote the book, The Privileged Planet, yeah. but not everybody will read a big book like that. Oh. Uh, in fact, many people don't read anymore. Um, right. how, how do you, how do you, how do you inoculate people against mm -hmm. these? I mean, I, even in the, in the political realm, you hear these yes. incredibly fabricated statements, but they're just communicated as though they're common sense fact. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and people are getting the information so quickly, they can't really fact check it, if you will. That's right. I mean, this is the irony of our moment, Hank, is that it, it, if you know how to do it, you can get access to almost any information from your house. Uh, but on the other hand, it's it's curated and manipulated, and most of us have lost the ability to focus. I mean, you said, so how do you inoculate your children? Well, you inoculate your children by making sure that they, I, I honestly think, don't, you aren't exposed to a lot of this stuff, so they're not exposed to the kind of fast-moving technology until their brains can handle it. You help them to develop the attention span to be able to read and study and ponder great texts. What and does that mean? Does, does that mean, Jay, you take the smartphones out of their hands? Or, or, I mean, it means they, they don't. Have, yeah, it means that if they're a little kid, you do not give them access to smartphones. Absolutely. I mean, you know, maybe 12, 15 years ago, I, I hadn't thought that much about this because, you know, they had just come online. Um, but it, I'm, I'm really glad that, um, you know, smartphones were, first of all, expensive and not really available when our girls were little anyway. Um, and so they got through that. But I've now seen what happens when kids, really young kids are given screens way too early. Um, and I'm not, I'm, no one can accuse me of being a Luddite, but this technology is designed kind of, it's for images and short attention spans for most people. And that's, I, it's quite clear that people's capacity for attention uh, is diminishing. And this is the difficulty. Okay, so how do you inoculate people in general that are subject to that, uh, uh, to these bad ideas? Well, you have to reach them in different ways. You do it on podcasts, for instance, or you do it in documentary style uh, format. And you so you hope that you can point people to the source, which is the big book with, you know, 100 pages of references. But I always 
try to remind myself that most people are going to read the headline and hear the summary. And so I got to figure out how to boil this down. I can tell you, this is always the difficulty with this book is first of all, there's a lot of data. It's a cumulative case argument. Um, and also it takes a couple of steps to explain it because it was just earth's unique and rare and therefore God designed it. That's a, that'd be really simple, but it's a little more complicated than that. But I also think it's much more satisfying once you get what's going on. And that's the difficulty. So first, optimize how you're going to inoculate your kids by giving them the capacity for attention. But then just as God condescends to us and our capacities, we have to do that for our, you know, our fellow human beings um, and so that we communicate at kind of different levels and in different paces and boil this stuff down in different ways. You just use the word optimized. Uh, I, I, this is a, a word you use in your book when you talk about yes. constrained optimization. I, I think that's a really interesting subject. It is. And so this is that we actually get, get the term from engineering. And every engineer knows this, that you don't optimize anything you're building for everything. So we, we use the example of a laptop, for instance. And so if you said, okay, what's the best laptop? You said, well, let's see, it would be the, the laptop with the biggest screen. Oh, really? Okay, so like, how big? 10 feet, square feet? Well, of course not, because then it's not portable, right? And so you say, well, okay, the one with the fastest processor available. Really? You, that's going to cost several million dollars. And by the way, it's going to be really unstable. Okay, now that's not going to be quite right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, how about weight? Uh, because if you want a big processor, it's going to be heavier and hotter and use a lot, of, a lot more battery power. You can see where this is going, of course. The best laptop is going to be the one that best optimizes all these competing conditions into this kind of sweet spot. And that's what if you're designing a bridge, it's the same thing. You're not, you're designing it for stability over time, uh, but you have to meet costs, you have to use the materials that are available, it's that kind of thing. And so people have to think of that, okay, now if you're building a planet, um, in which you're going to have all these different chemical elements, and you have sources of energy that are important from the sun, but also deadly, right? You can sort of imagine God, the great engineer, um, creating a material universe. They're going to be the, he, even God is going to have to make these kind of logical trade-offs. Um, and so we should, that's, but on the other hand, if the universe is designed for discovery, what we would find is that these best places that, that meet the conditions for life are also going to be the best places overall, in the same way that, that kind of the best laptop overall for scientific discovery. That is for making different kinds of discoveries that on their own require kind of a different set of conditions. And so you're, you're trying to solve this very complex problem. An omniscient God would never make the mistake of creating the human eye. I've heard that argument because yeah. there are problems with the human eye. But this, mm -hmm. again, goes to your point of constraint optimization. Absolutely. And of course, this is a story that we all heard for the longest time that the, 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 the human eye is, uh, is wired backwards. So there's this hole in it. Um, uh, and the idea is Richard Dawkins loves these arguments that, well, you know, God wouldn't have done anything this way, which is always interesting. The atheists know how God would have done things, but they're, yeah, but they're <laughs> just filming in their argument. It's that it looks like it's poorly engineered. And in every case, you just have to kind of have to look at the details. And in that case, knowledgeable people have quit using that argument because it turns out there is a really important functional reason for it to be to be wired that way. And in fact, the so-called hole in our visual system is um, compensated for in other ways so that it doesn't actually mess up our vision. Now, of course, the world has fallen, so we, don't, we can't always expect things are exactly the way God designed them originally. Nevertheless, so many of these arguments fall apart on closer inspection that I'm generally, I just usually treat the prior probability of these claims um, as pretty low, a very low chance of it being true, but I, you still got to look at the details. Yeah. Um, let, let's talk about one of the things you write about in the book, and that's solar eclipses. Mm. Uh, on the one hand, they're beautiful and they're inspiring. On the other hand, as you point out, they've played a very significant role in scientific discovery. That's right. And, and people wonder that's how we open the book. It's actually the, the idea of eclipses is what gave us the idea for the argument. Um, and so just to explain to people that maybe didn't see the eclipse or haven't thought about it is that to get a perfect eclipse like we have on the Earth, you need first to be all, all you need a sort of platform that you're on. You need an occulting or eclipsing body like the moon. You need a light source, which is the sun. And then you need them all to line up in space in a straight line. Um, 
And, and then if they're going to have a perfect eclipse, they need to appear the same size and shape from your vantage point, which is what we have, right? And that's, that's something that we take for granted, but we really shouldn't. And so as it happens from the Earth, um, the moon is 400 times closer than the sun. It's also 400 times smaller than the sun. And so you get this very eerie match between the sun and the moon um, so that we get these perfect eclipses where you get this, this kind of blackness in the sky. Guillermo and I saw it this April from Waxahachie, Texas, right in the center of the path of totality. It was about four and a half minutes. You know, you cannot look at the sun with the naked eye, even if there's a slight bit of the bright photosphere available. But as soon as the disk of the moon covers the sun, you can look at, you can look at it directly. It's like a black pupil with an iris uh, in the sky. It's absolutely magnificent. And so the question is, okay, well, that's neat, but what does that have to do with your argument? Well, two of the important things you need to build a habitable planet, the one big one is the distance from your host star. So you need to be where it's not too hot and not too cold, so-called Goldilocks zone. So if you're in the Goldilocks zone, that's gonna fix the size of the star in your sky, right, or sun. Another thing you need is a large, well-placed moon to stabilize the tilt of your planet's axis and to contribute to the tides. And when you get those two things that are needed for um, for life, to build to, two important ingredients for making your planet habitable, it sets up the conditions for perfect solar eclipses. And perfect solar eclipses, as you mentioned a minute ago, are this natural experiment that have allowed us to discover things about the universe that we would have had a very hard time discovering otherwise. Let me just give you one kind of the, the most intuitive example would be the test uh, for Einstein's general theory of relativity. So Einstein, when he developed his special and general theory, uh, a prediction of his theory, it's fairly arcane for people that don't study it, but would, was that there's this thing called space-time and massive objects. It's not like gravity is a force, a pulling force. What happens is that space-time gets bent by massive bodies, and then that affects the kind of movement of things around it. Um, and so a prediction of his theory, so well, if this, so if this is right, uh, as opposed to, the, say, the Newtonian view of, of gravity, then what would happen is that when a, a kind of directional light passes near the edge of a massive body, it would appear to move from where you would expect it to be. So for instance, if you were to look at the sun, or you look at the night sky and you map where the stars are when the sun's not there, and then you come back later when the sun is there and you look at stars that are those same stars passing right near the edge of the sun, it will look like they've moved because the light, the starlight passing near the edge of the sun will be curved, will be bent by the mass of the sun. Of course, you can't do that normally because you can't see the starlight near the edge of the sun except during a perfect solar eclipse. And that is exactly what happened during the eclipse of, 2000, or of 1919. Sir Arthur Eddington, a couple of teams tested this and confirmed Einstein's theory. And astronomers have continued to do that and to refine it since then. So really the most important theory of the 20th century that was at least the most important for understanding the universe as a whole was tested and was able to be tested because of a perfect solar eclipse. And there's a bunch of other examples, but eclipses, every astronomer knows um, how important eclipses have been for uh, for scientific discovery. And so it's it's sort of staggering to realize that, gosh, we, we enjoy these things, these amazing things, um, because of the needs for life. Uh, and when you get those, God is God. I think has set these this up so that we also um, get access uh, to the universe that we would not have otherwise. You know, in some sense, reading the Privileged Planet twenty years ago changed the way I look at the world. I mean, when I you know, you, you look in the in the daytime at the sun. Yes. Well, there's the sun. Look at night at the moon. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's a half moon, maybe it's a quarter. You look at it. So what? Sun, yeah. moon. But when you start to see the, 
the things like solar eclipses, uh, what yeah. you just mentioned, uh, the ratio of size between sun and moon, mm -hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden you recognize the words of Scripture being impactful and true. The heavens declare yes. the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they proclaim knowledge. There's no yes. speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their words go out to the ends of the earth. So you start looking at the universe yeah. differently, and I think that's one of the great advantages of this book. Book. I mean, mm. it, 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 it intoxicates you with the beauty and the glory of God's created handiwork, things that you might never otherwise pay any attention to. Absolutely. I mean, and people, and so eclipses, for the lucky people that are in the path of one during their life, of course, have been happening for thousands of years, and, and humans have been astonished by them the, the entire time. But our sort of understanding about what's required to set it up and the way in which it connects to the needs for habitability and, and discovery, these are all fairly recent discoveries. That's what's sort of amazing is that people have the, Christians often have the impression that, well, Science is overwhelmingly hostile to, to, to faith, and this is kind of the worst time to be alive for being a Christian. Well, in, in a sense, it's tough, but in another sense, it's probably the best time. I mean, it was only in the 20th century that we had really good empirical evidence that the universe had a beginning. Before then, we believed it on faith, and maybe there were some philosophical arguments for the impossibility of an infinite regress. But to, to realize that, no, in fact, the best evidence from, from the natural world tells us the universe had a beginning in the finite past. Christians spend our time arguing about how old it is. And don't notice that if it's old, if it's any age, that makes life very hard for the materialist because no longer can the material universe be the ultimate reality because it had a beginning. That's the era in which we live. And so I, I honestly think in some ways, God left it to this time for the created order to, to disclose these things about it. The psalmist, from the beginning, of course, the psalmist, as you said, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God. So it's actively participating in the glory of God, but there's rich detail and more detail all the way down. It's like wheels within wheels or an encrypted message in which there's one message at one level and then you magnify it and you find another message. That's, that's what I think is happening. And I think, look, if we're right, Guillermo and I, we found the first couple of dozen good examples of this, but we think if we're right, we'll discover a bunch of other stuff and, and the pattern will continue to be confirmed. What, you use so many memorable phrases. One of the phrases that you use in, in, in your talks and mm -hmm. in, in your writing is, is the fact that Earth is a data recorder. Yes. Yes. And, and this is another thing that uh, that's our chapter two. Um, and so we all know that you can count the age of a tree by reading tree rings as a kind of rough estimate, right? Um, and, and so it's just a kind of an accretion uh, of development with a, tr a tree ring so by, you know, cutting at the trunk of a tree. Um, a few people know that they're ice cores. So for instance, there's Lake Vostok um, in Antarctica and, and uh, 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 sites in Greenland um, in which you can kind of do the same thing vertically. You can just you like drill a core, uh, and there are these layers of ice that get more and more compressed. And based upon the, the isotope ratios that correspond to the sunspot cycles, you can actually date those in these kind of 11-year increments. And then based upon the materials that are in those layers and isotope ratios, you can actually figure out what's happening in the distant past in terms of temperature, what's happening in terms of the, the climate, um, all sorts of things that you can reconstruct it much sort of farther back than you could with tree rings. There are uh, cores on uh, lake sediments uh, and ocean sediments. There, you can do the same thing with stalactites and stalagmites. These are the, these layering processes that only exist. First of all, they're all um, either based upon the hydrological cycle or basic biological processes um, needed for life, and yet they're also laying down a recording of all sorts of things that have happened in the past so that we have a much better a much better understanding of what's happened. We kind of know that in terms of archaeology, and people might say, okay, well, that's neat. We know maybe a few hundred years uh, with trees, but you can find, you can get information a lot farther back. And so now remember our argument is that, okay, habitable planets are going to be better at these things than non-habitable planets. Well, guess what? Um, if you compare our planet and those layering processes to other planets, uh, they have nothing like this. They're just not 
really good data recording um, systems like that on, on planets that are hostile to life. So it's just yet another example. And so we think, look, when you walk around and you look at trees, be astounded, but also realize they're, they're data recorders. They're rolled up scrolls uh, recording data about what we're doing and what other people are doing and what the atmosphere is like at this moment. Let's get into something really controversial, uh, climate change. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, how does the privileged planet hypothesis inform the current climate change debate? I mean, we're we're, we're talking, uh, Jay, about politicians mm -hmm. being convinced that we need to spend tens, maybe hundreds of trillions of dollars on, on climate change, that it's an existential problem. Uh, that's the greatest problem. I mean, kids are afraid... Oh, yeah. Uh, there, uh, the fear mongering is intense, but 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 the privileged planet hypothesis actually helps inform us here. It does, and so uh, just for people that only follow this superficially, the claim, the sort of climate change catastrophist claim, is that our contributions of CO two in particular into the atmosphere, CO two is this three atom molecule, and so it's a greenhouse gas is causing the surface of the planet to heat up more, far more than it would naturally, and that's going to lead to catastrophic types of climate that's, as you said, going to be catastrophic to humans and to life. First thing to note is that there's no justification for those extreme claims. And so if you even read the, the overheated uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports from the UN, none of those never justify this. They'll say, okay, yeah, we think based upon our computer models that we'll get between one and five degrees centigrade warming in the next hundred years. There's really no, not even a justification for that. But notice that in either of those cases, it's not catastrophic. I mean, anyone living at, at upper latitudes uh, experiences a heck of a lot more than five degrees change in temperature every day. And so the idea that you know this would somehow lead to the extinction of life is, is just nonsense. But then the second question would be, okay, how sensitive is the climate to additions of CO2? And the great thing here is that we actually have data. As I mentioned, those recording devices, we have data about what's happened in the distant past. There are times in the distant past when the when the atmosphere had vastly, vastly more carbon dioxide, I mean, order of magnitude more carbon dioxide than it does now, there was no run at one runaway greenhouse effect. It wasn't didn't wipe out life. In fact, plant life really likes carbon dioxide. It's it's plant food. Uh, ironically, if you get too too uh, low concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, but below 150 parts per million, plant life ceases. So that that's the catastrophe. Um, and so th the fact that our planet actually records information allows us to test these predictive computer models. The computer models, remember, are just um, think programs on computers in which you plug in variables based on your assumptions and see what would happen if your assumptions are true. They have to be tested against reality. But we already know the climate is not nearly as sensitive to carbon dioxide as these models predict. And we know that precisely because the Earth has been recording this information. Now, here's the ironic thing, is that if you think about uh, what's really kind of worrisome in distant past climate, it's not warm patches, it's ice ages. Uh, when a huge amount of the earth is covered <laughs> in you know, a couple of uh, miles of ice, that's the thing we ought to worry about. And we're actually it, kind of due for another ice age. It may be that our contribution of CO2 through industrial processes, um, while not making all that much difference in terms of warming, may help be helping stave off another ice age. Uh, that's still kind of an open question, but we, we think there's actually some evidence of that. And so this is obviously sort of directly related to this. And I can tell you, Hank, I mean, Germa and I started following all this, this debate in 1999 and we started on the book. The arguments have gotten worse and worse and worse on the other side for catastrophe. And so it's it, it makes me really sad that people don't uh, know enough about the evidence that they just sort of, they, they believe these hysterical claims. So you have someone, and not to pick on any uh, particular politician, but uh, mm -hmm. Joe Biden mm -hmm. is kind of an easy target. Yeah. But you hear him talk about this dogmatically. Do you think, I mean, this is a speculative question. Do you think yeah. he really understands climate change in any, in any comprehensive sense? No, I don't think so. In fact, the only 
um, you know, there were, there was a politician, uh, um, in Hoff, Senator M. Hoff from Oklahoma that really followed the science. Um, Al Gore, though he was wrong about a lot of stuff, at least was kind of interested in the science. Now he infamously misinterpreted data from past climate in which he claimed that, um, what you get, wherever you get an increase in CO2, you get an increase in temperature. And so he was assuming that was a sort of causal relationship, but he had messed up the sequence because what actually happens is that you get the temperature increase about 800 years before the CO2 increase. And so he'd actually sort of reversed uh, um, cause and effect. And the reason for that is that when it's cool, the ocean can hold more CO2 and when it's warm, it releases it. So even the New York Times had to correct Al Gore on that in his documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. But he followed it. But most politicians that I've seen don't have any obvious understanding of this at all. They're, they're I, you know, generally, I assume most of them are sincere, but they're just listening to their sort of selected ex experts. Um, but notice that it's there's a if you're a politician that wants to increase your power, especially your power over people's choices and over the economy, uh, climate change hysteria gives you a justification for that because you can say, well, yeah, all things being equal, people should be free to make choices about transportation and fuel use, but there's this existential threat. And so for the common good, we're going to have to tell you exactly what you want to do. That's the net zero campaign, this idea that we're going to, by 2050 or even 2030, um, contribute no net carbon emissions, no more CO2 uh, to the atmosphere. Well, this is completely insane. This is never going to happen. China and India are still um, developing. They're not going to quit doing it. Um, and so that's why I think we should just look askance at politicians talking about this, because it's, it's a justification for them to increase their power over us, even if they're sincere. I think that's basically what this is about. And very few of them, so far as I can tell, have actually spent any time studying the details. Yeah, so for all of us, many years ago, I learned from you a particular sequence that will help mm -hmm. all of us. Uh, you, 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 you taught us really how to ask the right questions and then how to ask the right questions in the right sequence. So when you're confronted with something like climate change, you actually know what to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And so this is the four questions, which is probably maybe the thing that I've developed that went the farthest was just these four questions. So somebody says, do you believe in global warming or climate change? That's actually a bundle of different claims, uh, you know, sort of put together. So the question you want to ask is, OK, first, um, is it warming? Right. Is the earth warming? That's just that straightforward empirical question. Is there a warming trend if you take some baseline, say, 1850 to the present? That's just what's happening, right? So let's go look at the evidence. The second question is, are we causing it? That is, is human activity the, uh, the, the main or primary cause of it? So that's a separate question, right? That's gonna be the cause, something's happening. What's causing it is a different question. Um, you know, the ice caps could be melting, polar bears could be drowning. That doesn't tell you whether humans are, are doing anything to it. The third question is, is it bad? That is, it, let's assume that the earth's warming. Let's assume humans are causing it. Is it bad? That is, is the warming bad and is the contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere bad? The only way you could say that warming is bad is if you knew that the optimum, what the optimum global temperature was. That is, what's the optimum average global temperature? If we knew what that was, then you could, you'd say, okay, well, are we moving toward it or away from it? Uh, climate alarmists assume that we're moving away from it, that somehow we're it's it's cooler than it is now. But there's actually no evidence that that's the case. It could be very well that the optimum temperature, say, for human life or plant life is a little warmer than it is now. So that so and that's at least a debatable question. And then the fourth question is, um, let's assume the answer to the first three is yes, that uh, the Earth's warming, we're causing it, it's bad. Would any of the advised policies make any difference? And that's an economic question. It's actually really easy. Um, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, initially in the 90s, we knew would cost trillions of dollars and make no difference. The Paris Accords, the UN Paris Accords, which countries generally did not abide by, uh, would cost a lot and make no difference. Uh, net zero would cost, I, I mean, net zero would just basically move us back to a hunter-gatherer stage or something like that, probably. So the cost would be immense and it still wouldn't probably make a difference. Um, and then I've since added a fifth question, what should we do instead? So in other words, the policies that are being advised are crazy. What should we do instead? Well, we know that the wealthier a country is, the more technologically advanced, 
the more they're able to adapt to things. So if whatever happens, right, if we have an ice age, if we have increased warming, the wealthier country is, the easier it's going to be for them to adapt to it. So what we should do is pursue policies, global policies and trade policies that help poor countries become wealthier so that they can adapt to it just as well as as we can. And the bonus is that as countries get wealthier, they get more concerned about environmental issues. And so if you're really poor and you're using dung for fuel in your, in your hut, you're not concerned about what parts per million of CO2 are in the atmosphere. Um, but when a country gets wealthy, we, we start worrying about things like the purity of the water in the air. And so I think that's, that's the answer. Whatever ultimately you think um, about the, the, those questions, what we really should be doing if we care about people is helping the rest of the world get wealthy. Yeah, so a, a couple of things. There has to be a balance here though, right? Because mm -hmm. we are called to be good stewards of God's creation. Uh, yeah. You're not negating that. Not at all. I mean, that's an imperative. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have to be good stewards. So yeah, that's, it's fantastic for us to be good stewards. But on the other hand, we can't give in to pseudoscience. That's right. And, and this is the, I think this is honestly the reason that Christians get buffaloed by this is that our, our compassion and our, our, um, our correct theology gets weaponized against us. So they say, look, you believe that we should be stewards of the world. God's, you know, told us to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth to till the garden and keep it. Um, and climate change is the worst environmental disaster in a generation. So Christians need to get on board. That's a that's a kind of <laughs> there's some illusion there logically. Uh, to be a good steward, right? Is is in other words, we we do need to tend this. So I would say that's why we should find out what we're doing, right? And find out if it's actually harming things. Let's fix it. Um, I just think that the hysteria about climate change um, is overblown and based on bad arguments uh, uh, and bad inferences. And moreover, it tends to suck the air out of the room when it comes to real environmental concerns. I, there are legitimate environmental concerns with respect to toxins, and I worry about certain food additives and things that we have in the water that we're not paying attention to. We've been good at getting the big toxins out, but I think there's, look, we're doing something to the environment in our surroundings that it, to increase, massive increase in, um, in chronic diseases, especially among kids could be an environmental thing. We're not focusing on that. We're focusing on these kind of things uh, having to do with climate change that I don't think uh, are sort of well justified. So if you want to be a good steward and you're, you want to care about the environment, the first thing you got to do is be discerning so that you can focus on things that actually help and not focus on things that actually hurt. Yeah, discernment. You know, there's another thing that comes to mind, and, and you do write about this in your book as well, earthquakes. And I'm thinking about uh, not only um, earthquakes, but hurricanes. I mean, we've yes. just had two incredibly oh. catastrophic hurricanes. And a lot of people will say, look, earthquakes, hurricanes are all signs that we're in a global warming catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, the earthquakes are more frequent and more powerful. The hurricanes are more frequent, more powerful, etc. A lot of that is based on myth misinformation, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's so strange. And so people will, they'll take, for instance, a comparison if you're to do sort of property damage in Florida in 2024 from a hurricane uh, compared to property damage in 1700. Well, there's almost no property damage in 1700, not because there are no hurricanes, but because nobody was building stuff there, right? And so you're not comparing apples and apples. Um, so the relevant question is, okay, if warming is causing uh, an increase in intensity of hurricanes, cyclones, tornadoes, let's look at the evidence. Anyone can do this, you can go online. There's absolutely no trend. There is no trend of increasing frequency, of increasing intensity of hurricanes or tornadoes. Um, and in fact, weirdly, uh, on, on some measures, there seems to be a kind of a declining trend. The problem is, is that every hurricane and every tornado is used as an example of climate change. And so that people come to interpret these events with that kind of framework, forgetting that, okay, there've always been hurricanes. So the only way to test that claim would be to look and see if there's a, a trend line uh, of increasing intensity and deadliness. And there just isn't one. So there's no reason to think that that's the case. Moreover, even on a kind of climate change theory is that the warming is gonna happen primarily 
at the poles and not at the equator. And it's actually the, the difference between the temperature difference between the equatorial regions and the poles that give rise to hurricanes. So if anything, just on the theory itself, you'd expect hurricane intensity to decrease. Um, but there's a kind of, there's just a rhetorical need for this. And so I always say, you know, when um, when a cold thing happens, that's weather. When a hot thing happens, that's climate change. Um, and, you know, they, they just count on everyone. If, if we have a, a, a year that happens to have low uh, hurricane frequency, there, nobody's going to talk about it. If we have a year like this in which we have a couple of really bad ones, it's going to be all climate change all the time, right? But what they're giving, they're giving us an interpretive framework uh, so that we will see these things as sign of of the theory, uh, when in fact that that's not how you would do this. These are just individual data points. I want to talk about some other very interesting thing in chapter four of your book. It's titled "Peering Up," and you talk about the transparent atmosphere. Yeah, and, and you talk about it as one of the most eerie coincidences known to science. So you put a great deal of emphasis on this, and yes. I want you to impact that for a moment. Absolutely. And so it's important to realize that just not not any part of the electromagnetic spectrum would be useful for chemical life. And so like people would say, well, okay, if um, you know, you're around a planet in which you didn't get visible light on the surface, but maybe you got x-ray or microwave light, then life would just evolve to use that uh, that part of the electromagnetic spectrum. No, that just misunderstands the kind of basic needs for life in this universe. It needs to be based on carbon. Carbon is the element that is um, what's called metastable. So it, it's it's stable enough that you can build three-dimensional complex molecules like proteins. You can code information in DNA, um, but not so stable that it doesn't undergo chemical reactions. So it's, it's this kind of sweet spot. So you need, if you're going to have life in the universe, information bearing life, it's going to be based on carbon. And then you're going to need a solvent for it uh, where these reactions can take place. Well, that's water. So water and carbon are perfectly suited to each other. Carbon chemistry is most reactive uh, over this narrow range of temperatures over which water is liquid. And it's the same kind of thing in the electromagnetic spectrum. There are going to be certain types of electrom, uh, of, of energy, think of it that way, sort of energy from a star that that life will fi find useful and some that's not useful uh, or is deadly. All right. So our atmosphere, which is another kind of feature of the, the same life, is going to need a nitrogen and oxygen rich atmosphere. Um, there's lots of choices. They're not all like that. That's, of course, what we have. Nitrogen rich and oxygen rich atmosphere is what's needed chemically for this, these life forms. It also happens to be transparent to, to the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, so that, that that part of the spectrum that's needed for life gets through the atmosphere to the surface. Uh, but the atmosphere is not transparent to other parts of the spectrum. Uh, and because of the, the magnetic field we have around the Earth, a lot of the kind of deadly stuff that we might otherwise encounter is, is blocked. Now, now that's interesting uh, because you could ask this other question. So if you were to look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you've got the short wavelengths or gamma and X-ray on one end, and then you get radio waves on the other. And it just means the wavelengths are really, really large. And then think of the the visible light is that light that's, you know, we think of as when we put it through a prism is in a rainbow. That is a really, really tiny slice of the sort of range of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum in the universe. Um, now ask yourself the question, if you had access to only like a little sliver of that for discovering the universe, which sliver would you want to have access to? Well, it turns out the kind of the most information rich part of the stuff that you want is in the visible part of the spectrum. So for life, uh, you need an atmosphere that has the right kind of chemical elements. That co the constituents of chemical elements allows uh, the right kind of energy to come from the, uh, your host star. And that's the same little part of the spectrum that's the most informative for doing science. That's just crazy. I mean, and so it, we're talking, the, the numbers are so sort of mind boggling um, that when you realize this, you think, well, it's, this is either the eeriest thing I've ever seen or there's some kind of trick. Um, it, it, but it really is just absolutely wild. And one final thing on this, Hank, because you might say, okay, yeah, but okay, if that's really useful, then of course you're going to want to be able to see as well as you can. But of course we get clouds in our atmosphere. So sometimes you live in Seattle, probably never seen the Aurora Borealis, for instance, because it's cloudy. Well, remember we were talking about um, the constrained op optimization a few minutes ago. As it happens, 
Yeah, you want to have a clear atmosphere for seeing the planets around the sun and to be able to look at the moon and to see the distant galaxies uh, with a telescope. And so you need a clear atmosphere, but you don't want a perfectly clear atmosphere in the sense that it's totally dry because there's a whole other set of things that you need to discover um, that require a hydrological cycle, that require water in the atmosphere. Um, one of those things is rainbows. You only get a rainbow if you have water that has water droplets at just the right size to be able to refract the visible light into the rainbow, which was actually cru crucial for scientific discovery. Um, and so really what you want is a partly cloudy atmosphere for doing all of these things. And so, you know, that's sort of counterintuitive because people think, well, yeah, what about clouds? Actually, those are really useful. So even though it can be frustrating if you've got a, you know, a sky uh, viewing night and it gets cloudy, overall for science, this is exactly what you'd want. You know, you mentioned some things in this discussion so far that I think are, 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 are either elements that are underappreciated or elements that get a bad rap. Uh, for yeah. example, you just mentioned water, yes. underappreciated. Carbon dioxide, I think, gets oh. a bad rap. Yes, absolutely. It does. I mean, water is crazy. It's got all these weird anomalous properties. So, for instance, um, it's lighter when it's frozen. So, in its, in its solid state, is lighter than in its liquid state. Almost every other thing that you can think of, every compound and every element, that's not how it works. Uh, but this is why water is so uniquely suited for life. And so um, one example of this, so it, you get the freezing, you get the oceans that freeze on the poles. Well, if ice didn't float, if it sunk, that ice would freeze up, it would sink to the bottom of the ocean, it'd be out of access to the, to the sun, the energy from the sun, and so more would freeze and it would keep sinking and you'd end up with this kind of almost entirely frozen ocean. As it is, the surface freezes, and it insulates the water underneath it. So that, that's true, the kind of fact that ice floats um, ends up being important at the planetary level. For other reasons, it's important for plant life and, and cellular life. And so water is this, even though it's just, you know, a couple of uh, atoms of hydrogen and an atom of oxygen, it's crazy when it comes to its, its, its fitness for life. And then carbon dioxide also, I mean, we, we treat it as if it's a pollutant, well, guess what? Plants take carbon dioxide and they, <laughs> they use it, right? It's a part of their life cycle and then they give us the oxygen. So um, it, it's really wild that this trace, um, this trace compound, this trace molecule that's in our atmosphere that is the result both of respiration of, of animal life, um, but also plant food and the result of industrial activity should some, somehow be treated as if it's an environmental toxin, which it just absolutely is not. This is off the wall, but should we all be driving electric cars? I mean, yeah, like I, if you were in, uh, I, I, it's funny you say this, Hank, because I actually really wanted to get a Tesla, I get a, 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 not a new car, but a slightly used car about every 10 years. And in DC, the Tesla is ideal because it's like a 30 year, 30 mile commute. They don't go anywhere else. Um, and you get all sorts of benefits. In fact, my neighborhood has a free hookup out here. I could get free power. Um, the problem is, is that if everybody were doing that, we don't have enough copper wire. We simply don't have the capacity in the grid for everybody to be able to do that. So even if you thought for various reasons, yeah, it makes sense to have electric cars so we're not hauling heavy fuel around with us. We don't have the capacity to do this. Um, in order to do it, to build these batteries, we are relying on rare earth minerals from places like China, which have terrible environmental uh, records. And for me, if anyone is really serious about converting uh, from internal combustion engines to electric cars, the only way that's ever at all realistic or that we're even going to increase the, the kind of percentage of electric cars is to increase the power of the grid. And the only way to do that without increasing the use of fossil fuel to, to for the power plants would be nuclear power. And yet a lot of the same people don't want to do that. So I think it's, I don't know if they imagine that compost and some windmills and some solar power uh, is somehow gonna, gonna do this. There's just basic physics preventing that. So um, yeah, I, I suspect we could be one or two uh, battery innovations away from it making set more sense to use uh, battery powered cars, but we wanna follow market dynamics on that. The reason almost everyone's still driving internal combustion engines is because at the moment, it's the most abundant, least expensive 
fuel for those purposes for most people. That's the reason. It's not because people hate the earth. It's because it's still all things being equal, the kind of best fuel to use. I always say uh, contrast is the conduit to, to clarity. And in, in mm. chapter five of your book, you talk about the pale blue dot. So here's my question. How does Earth and our solar system compare with the thus discovered, the, the, mm. the, the, the planets that we have and, and the exoplanets that we have yeah. uh, discovered mm. thus far? That's right. So um, when we first wrote the book in 2004, there were about 100 exoplanets that we had detected. It's now, uh, I think, over 5,000, actually. Say that one more time. Yeah. When, so 20 years ago, we knew about 100. 100. Yeah. We now 5,000 or 5, more. 5,000. That's right. And so we're getting better and better. We still can't quite detect Earth-sized planets because they perturb their stars so little. So the first ones we detected, because we're not seeing the planets themselves, what we're seeing is the effect of the planets on the, the sort of the the, intera the gravitational interactions uh, of the planets or the transit of the planet in front of the star along our line of sight. So you can detect either kind of a slight dip in the light or you, we can we have instruments to be able to detect slight wobbles in the the star, and then you can sort of infer the orbit and the size of the planet, basically. Um, and so we now know, yeah, there's lots of planets around other stars. Um, when the book first came out, I can tell you, I think every NASA press release would talk about an extrasolar planet, the most Earth-like planet ever discovered, and we'd look at it, and it would be something like Jupiter, except it would be in this wildly elliptical orbit, it, it most of, half spending most of its life inside the orbit of Mercury, right? So a hot Jupiter, completely useful, useless to life. And if there were an Earth-like planet in that system, it would have gotten destroyed by that planet. And so we had this happen so much that I finally started telling reporters, look, call us when you find an Earth-like planet that is as Earth-like as Mars. Because Mars is the most Earth-like planet yet known other than Earth. It is around the star, so we know it's in a habitable system. It's roughly the same kind of size and mass as the Earth. It has some of the same elements. It's only slightly outside the orbit of the Earth. Um, it can even exchange material with the Earth. Uh, and yet it's utterly lifeless. And so that tells you, uh, basically Venus just on the inside of our orbit and Mars on the outside, tells you how narrow the conditions are for an Earth-like planet, even in an otherwise habitable system. They're totally lifeless. And then, of course, nobody expects to find life around, you know, and say in Jupiter or Saturn, which are gas giants, so they don't have stable surfaces, um, or the outer gas or ice giants, Jupiter and Uranus. What we're doing now is we're looking at some of the, the moons. So we have just, NASA has just sent um, a mission, it's just taken off um, to look at Europa, which is a moon around Jupiter. It's a very interesting moon. We spend a bunch of time talking about Europa in the in the book. Uh, and, and so what's interesting about it is that it has this solid ice surface. And so as we said, ice floats, so maybe there's a liquid ocean just underneath it, and maybe there's life inside there. Well, that's basically saying, okay, we know life's important, so any place or, or water is important for life, so any place we can find water we'll have life. Well, we're getting ready to test that by going to Europa. And we think, sorry, you need a heck of a lot more. But in some ways, I think that shows you how much we've downgraded things in the, in the 20th century. In the 30s, Americans panicked over Orson Welles' radio program, War on the Worlds, because they mistook it for an actual newscast about Martians invading Earth. Well, no one would fall for that now. We know that there are no Martians uh, because we've actually been there and can see it. And so now what we're doing is we're looking for evidence of liquid water on the, in the distant past on Mars, and we're sending billion dollar probes to Europa uh, in a moon around Jupiter. So that, that we, in many ways, that's the trend line that we've seen from imagining everything we see from the moon to, to Mars has life on it, to realizing, okay, well, let's at least try to see if there's water somewhere. Um, the reality is 5,000 extrasolar planets, not one of those is even as Earth-like as Mars. And so not one of them is likely to have life on it. Your, your book is titled Privileged Planet. And I want to focus on that word planet for just a moment because mm -hmm. planets uh, play an incredible role uh, in our existence and survival. Yeah. yeah, they do. I mean, of course, astrologers 
this was this astrological claim is that the sort of location of planet planet by the way is based on word that just means wanderers so they people that are accustomed to seeing the night sky like the ancients would have been would notice that this background of stars that stays more or less the same the pattern um and then you get these wanderers in the the foreground which we call the they call the planets um, and astrologers would say, well, if you were born under Jupiter and Jupiter is in a particular constellation that supposedly sort of said something about your destiny. Now, I don't think there's really anything to that at all. Nevertheless, the planets do play a role in our existence. And, and, and you can think of it as Jupiter and Saturn are like giant guardians of the inner part of the solar system because our solar system is not just the sun and eight or nine moons to, or, or planets, if you count nine, if you count um, Pluto, it's also populated by billions or trillions of comets in the outer part of the solar system that spend most of their time way out in the outer reaches. But every so often, they, they're, they're still gravitationally connected to the sun. And so they will eventually come into the inner part of the solar system um, in, to our neighborhood. Well, now comets, if you encounter a large comet and you're a planet with life on it, that's a negative encounter. They can be a sterilized life. Um, but because we have these giant planets in our part of the solar system, they end up taking a lot of hits for us. So they actually protect the inner part of the solar system and make it much more habitable. So we think um, you, you need more than just the right kind of sun and the right kind of planet by itself, you probably need a system very much like the one that we have. Now, the moment we're fairly confident that Jupiter and Saturn play a role in our existence, we're, we'd like to, you know, find evidence that in fact, the other planets also play a role. But at the moment, you know, it's like, we focus on the things that we know at this point. Um, and so, we, you know, I can't say one way or the other what role, say, Mercury would play. Um, but we do know that the, at least the large planets in the outer part of the solar system make the inner part of the solar system where we are much more habitable. What happens to you, uh, to your temperature level, when you, you hear someone like Neil uh, uh, deGrasse Tyson yeah. talk about the sun, you just mentioned the mm -hmm. sun, and, and, and say the sun, he appends the word mediocre to yeah. sun. So the sun is just mediocre what, what what happens to your temperature when you hear that I, i'm trying to work on my temperature actually so that i just say well what is mediocre exactly and so presumably mediocre just means sort of average or something like that and so i guess maybe he's saying look, if, in, in terms of size maybe or something it's sort of it's not a tiny star like an m dwarf but it's not a blue super giant or something i don't know because you'd say, okay, well, if we're gonna grade stars with respect to mediocrity and um, grandiosity, how are you gonna grade them? Well, it's not gonna be size, is it? Or something like that. It's gonna be like, okay, which ones are most conducive to life in a planetary environment? That is, which ones are the best host in a planetary system for a, a life-giving planet? Well, it's ours. It's precisely it's yellow dwarf like the one that we have. It's very stable. All stars are slightly variable, but what you don't want is a star that's just constantly varying its output of energy. You need stability so that if you have a planet around a fairly circular orbit, you know, it's going to get roughly the same amount of energy over long periods of time. It needs actually to be just the right size. So if it's too small, like a, a red giant, which is really what that's, those are the mediocre stars that are that are just all over the place. To be in the Goldilocks zone around a red red dwarf, you have to be, the planet has to be much, much, much closer. And because of the inverse square law of gravity, the closer you get, the more kind of intense that the gravitational attraction is. So you get in the Goldilocks zone around a red dwarf, what's gonna happen over time is that your planet's not gonna be able to orbit uh, on its axis, like ours does, it's going to get locked in. It's called tidally locked, where the same part of the, one face uh, surface of the planet faces the sun uh, during its entire year. And so you're going to get one hot side and one side that's frozen solid. And so it's going to be almost certainly lifeless or at least hostile to life. If the star is too large, it's going to give off all sorts of uh, sterilizing radiation. Also, if you're too close around a red dwarf, you're going to get solar flares that are going to affect your planet. So there's just so many details to go into. But the gist of it is that you need a lot of stuff to go right in terms of the composition and the size and the status of the star, where it is, is it by itself. And once you add all those things up, 
um, if if we say okay, the, the most significant star is going to be the one, then the one that's most um, the best hostess for life. That's our sun. It's going to be small yellow dwarfs that are by themselves in the right neighborhood within a galaxy. And so it's very hard to to justify the claim that our uh, sun is mediocre unless you're just sort of, I don't know, adding them up, by, sort of lining them up by size or something and then saying, well, the sun is kind of in the middle. I mean, that's, it's like the only sense I can even make of that claim. You've already sort of talked about this, but I think it bears emphasis, and that is our place in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, how significant is the precise placement of the pale blue dot or Earth in the flattened spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy? It's really important. I mean, the first thing is you got to be the right kind of galaxy. So you could be in a galaxy that doesn't have any a lot of heavy ele elements in it or that has very erratic and irregular orbits. Um, and so you, you want a large spiral ga galaxy like we have. But as I mentioned earlier it, it, um, uh, in our conversation, the center of the galaxy is hostile to life because of it's much denser with stars, black holes. Uh, sterilizing radiation. So you don't want to be anywhere near that, but you don't want to be too far from the center of the galaxy or you end up with this basically a lot of hydrogen and helium. And so you can't build rocky planets. Um, and then you don't want to be in the spiral arms. And so you want to be basically midway out. We're 27,000 light years from the center to the edge of the galaxy. So it's roughly the galaxy, if you think of it from edge to edge, is about 100,000 light years across. Um, and so that's exactly where we are. It's like a dotted line uh, around the, the galaxy, um, not including the spiral arms. But now then the second question would be, okay, so if you could only pick one place for doing science, where would that be? Well, even if you could exist in the center of the galaxy, you would not want to be there because if you're in the center of the galaxy, you couldn't tell um, whether a source of radiation wouldn't be obvious if it was coming from nearby, from inside your galaxy, or from another galaxy, or from the background radiation, because they'd be the symmetrical on your sky. So everywhere you pointed, you know, your radio telescope, it would sort of look the same. As it is, because we're we're you know halfway out, um, the galaxy um, appears asymmetrical across our sky. So if you, you know if you go up to Colorado Springs at night or someplace up on a mountain, you'll see that Milky Way band across the sky. You're looking edge on at the thickness of the galaxy and so you the density of the stars. Well, that's how it is in the radio part of the spectrum too. You're, you're gonna notice that. Um, and so you'd say, okay, that's coming from the galaxy. So that's nearby. What's this weird uh, radiation that we're getting uniformly in every direction in the microwave part of the spectrum? That's the cosmic background radiation. So it actually been hard to detect that if we'd been in the center of the galaxy, even if you could have existed there. And then of course, if you're in uh, a murky part of the galaxy, you might not even be able to see the planets uh, um, in your own system. You certainly wouldn't be able to see stars and you certainly wouldn't be able to see galaxies outside the galaxy. So long and the short of it is if you could pick one place in the galaxy for doing science, um, it's in the galactic habitable zone. In other words, in that part of the galaxy that's the best place for life itself. Another interesting thing, and I think you point this out in your book as well, that's probably where I got this from, but there's a lot of talk on the internet about how telescopes have undermined Big Bang cosmology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't I don't sort of get this because um, there, there's always a kind of skepticism because of the James Webb uh, uh, t Space Telescope because what it's allowing us to do is basically, you know, so to remind listeners, so when you're looking into the distant universe, you're not looking at it at something at the, this moment because light has a finite speed. And so what you're seeing is you're sort of sampling different time periods in the universe. Um, and so because the universe is large, we're able to visually sample different time periods. James Webb allows us to sort of reach farther back. And so lots of cosmologists had these models of, of galactic evolution, as it's called, and cosmic evolution, in which the models assumed uh, okay, how long did it take from the Big Bang and the decoupling and the sort of formation of elements in order for us to get galaxies like we see now? And the assumption was that it takes a really long time to get that. Um, and so then all of a sudden we're discovering what were considered to be mature galaxies. 
And so some people say, oh, well, that totally undermines the evidence of a Big Bang. That is the evidence of a finite past. No, not at all. What it undermines is these models. It just, it looks like, gosh, um, it, things had to be really fine-tuned uh, beyond what we thought because it's it's surprising how quickly you can get galaxy formation once you get the elements in place. It, it's sort of like finding life on Earth almost as soon as life could exist, right? Um, th that, that tells you something. And so uh, people in some ways, they were so attached to their, their theoretical models of how this was supposed to have happened that when we finally get some direct evidence of it, it's like they get totally skeptical and said they need to go back to the drawing board because clearly they got something wrong uh, about what happens when galaxies form early in the, in the history of the universe. I want to ask you a question that one of my grandkids might ask me. Uh, they, they, they might say something like, why is the night sky dark, Papa? But that's <laughs> something you address in your book. Absolutely. And it's it's called Olber's Paradox. This is a, in some ways, you know, I said earlier that we just in the 20th century finally have empirical evidence that the universe had a beginning because of the cosmic background radiation, the cosmic expansion. In fact, we've always had evidence of that. The fact that the night sky is dark it means the, the, the universe is not infinite in expanse and it hasn't always been like this. Because if the universe had always been like this, same basic kind of density and there are an infinite number of stars, then at every point from an infinite amount of time ago, there should have been a star uh, pointing in our direction. And so the night sky should not be the night sky. It should be as bright as the surface of the sun. The fact that it's dark is itself evidence that the universe is not uh, infinite either in space or in time, uh, which is a really remarkable thing. The other thing is that the, it's only because of the night sky that we're actually able to see a lot of stuff. There's, you can't see distant stars and things like that during the day. Um, and so the evidence was always there. It was called Olber's paradox, though, Hank, because it's only a paradox if you assume the universe is eternal and infinite. Uh, if it's not, a, it's not a paradox. You say, well, yeah, of course, maybe this, yeah, the night, the sky is dark. I guess the universe not, must not be eternal. That would have been the, the kind of more natural inference. Wow, good answer. And, you know, one of the things that you point out in your book, and I mean, maybe this is as, as basic, not in the sense of unimportant, but basic mm -hmm. and important, is that our universe is fine-tuned for not only discovery, but for the existence of life itself. Yeah. That's right. And so everything we've talked about so far is like, think of it as the fine-tuning of the stuff you need to get right at the local level. But then you have the question, okay, well, what about the universal properties of the universe, the stuff that's true everywhere uh, that govern the structure of molecules and the elements and planets? And so there's sort of basically three of these kind of universal properties. So there's the, um, the initial conditions. So what that would be is, okay, how do things have to be set up right at the beginning in order to have a universe like we have now? Uh, then there are the laws, so like the law of gravity that people will learn in physics. And then within the laws, there are these sort of variables um, that might be M or C or something, and they're constants. And so these are just, they're constant. What that means is they're just literally constant. They're the same everywhere. Um, and so they're these kind of mathematical properties of the universe um, that are, are true absolutely everywhere. Well, physicists in the 1950s started realizing, okay, so you've got the gravitational force constant, so that's that kind of big force. You've got electromagnetic, uh, and the strong and the weak nuclear forces. So these are called the four fundamental forces. This is where it was first noticed. And some physicists said, you know, it's weird because if you fiddled with the electromagnetic constant and made it different, or you fiddled with the gravitational force constant, um, you would not get a universe that had life in it. In fact, you probably wouldn't get a universe that had planets or galaxies it, um, as it happens. It's like these constants are very precisely tuned for the existence of life. In fact, it's called the fine-tuning problem. Well, it's only a problem if you don't really like the idea of the universe having been fine-tuned. But if you just, let's just say, okay, if it quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, maybe it's a duck. If the universe looks fine-tuned, maybe it is. Uh, if it looks fine-tuned for life, maybe it is. And that's, that's, again, a basic discovery of 20th century physics uh, that confirms the theistic worldview. Lots of physicists have spent <laughs> decades trying to find uh, loopholes to get around it, but it's an extraordinary thing. And it's strong enough that it actually has led 
um, some atheists just itself, like the late Anthony Flew, was persuaded by the fine tuning and the evidence for design and DNA to move from atheism to deism. And Hank, even, even my debate way back in 2008, when I debated the, the late new atheist Christopher Hitchens at Stanford, was about God and science. And he ended up he ended up pivoting to deism, right? Because he realized, okay, it's that does the argument for fine tuning does sound like there's some purpose in the universe. So he said, yeah, maybe deism is true, but God doesn't care anything about us, which I thought was kind of an interesting concession. Um, it's really not a good time to be an atheist if you are honest with the evidence from physics and cosmology. Yeah, you know, I want to read a quote from uh, from your book that caught my attention. I wrote it down here on a piece of paper. Um, but this in the context of features of our universe that allow us to discover the laws of nature. You say the universe is an excellent tutor. Mm. It has not been so demanding as to ensure failure, but instead has presented us with worthy challenges that we can meet with diligence. And when I read that, I immediately thought of Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of God's people to search out a matter. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and we've known that. Um, I mean, anyone that studies scripture like you have for a lifetime, you can read Genesis 1 and a seven, you can read Genesis 1 to a seven year old. It's sort of simple and easy to get. And it's it's bottomless, though, the text, when you especially get into the Hebrew, um, that's how the created order is. Um, and we were talking there specifically about the way in which, okay, if you had to go from, say, a hunter-gatherer stage when you don't have a written language, and to figure anything out scientifically, you needed Einstein's general theory of relativity. There's like, there's no way to get there from here, right? But as it happens, um, it's like the world has been set up so that fairly difficult, it takes work, uh, but we're able to figure things out. And then sort of each theoretical stage um, helped us to understand some things. And then it gave us a platform to discover the next stage. So you needed Kepler to get Newton and you needed Newton to get Einstein. And if you had to go straight to Einstein um, without the intermediate steps, you wouldn't have gotten there theoretically. Um, and that that was something that honestly we kind of realized late in the book, this, this stair-stepping uh, of physical discoveries and then theoretical discoveries. And then Christian philosopher Robin Collins has actually has developed this more beyond what we did in terms of the kind of the theoretical stair-stepping in which God has set stuff up so that if we're diligent, we can discover these things, but it's still a worthy enterprise. It's not like some kind of fake game that you know a parent will give to their six-year-old so that they're sure to win. Um, it, it's something that is a genuine accomplishment when we discover these things. We hear this little phrase over and over again in various contexts, size matters. <laughs> a comment on size. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, is our mark of, uh, of smallness a uh, a symptom of disrepute is our puny size in comparison to the universe something that denigrates uh, the greatness of Earth. I don't know why. I mean, yeah, clearly that it would um, the fact that you know, let's say a star, just a big lump of a giant lump of uh, of hydrogen gas or something that's a light year across. Okay, spatially that's huge compared to the Earth or compared to an individual human being. But surely a single human being is much more magnificent than just this kind of cloud of hydrogen. And so size is not a specially good measure in the abstract for significance. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, and we actually do the calculation in the book, that the irony is that on a kind of logarithmic scale, um, the Earth, the sort of human Earth size scale is actually in the middle of size scales that we know in the universe. So if you think of the universe as a whole as the big scale and you go all the way down to say quarks on the small scale, the, the human earth size scales in the middle, which is interesting. So we're not tiny and we're not huge, but that's where you'd wanna be for scientific discovery as it happens. So if we were just to say an order of magnitude smaller for this or the size of ants, 
Um, there, most of the universe would have been inaccessible to us. They're kind of just basic physical dynamics in terms of the kind of instruments you'd need, what you'd need to be able to control fire, the size of lenses you'd need for telescopes, these kinds of things. Um, in order to see large structures, you need to be about our size scale. On the other hand, if we were much larger, it would have been very hard for us to detect things at a very small scale. So for scientific discovery, um, we're actually right in the sweet spot, but it would be really easy to miss that if you somehow thought our middling size compared to a blue supergiant somehow made us unimportant. Is that constrained to optimization again? Because one of the points you make in the book is that our size is perfect for the adaptation of technology. That's right. It's absolutely constrained optimization. And our, our friend uh, and colleague, Michael Denton, has actually taken this farther. In fact, he has a series, Discovery Institute Press on Privileged Species, um, the, the kind of technological stuff, which we talk a bit about in the book. But um, so much of technology depends upon our ability to control fire. Um, and, you know, look, ants can't control fire because of their size. <laughs> and so it's, there's this kind of weird interlocking features of this thing, when you really start analyzing it, they get, as you said, eerie. And people that get the argument, Hank, like really early on, I think the first time, the first times we even presented this stuff, Guillermo spoke at a conference, I feel like it was around 2000 or 2001 in, at Yale. I was there and a guy named Scott Minnick at the University of Idaho was there and he heard the, our discussion about eclipses. It kept him awake all night. I mean, but this is a smart guy, a scientist who he got it right away. And he started running out the implications of this in his mind. And he thought this was the eeriest thing I'd ever heard. Just eerie in the sense that it's like a, wow, this is like a cosmic conspiracy that I didn't know anything about, which we, we think that's actually the right response. Well, this discussion wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about the Copernican uh, principle. Um, you know, like, like, like all, it, it's a myth, and like all great myths, it's a mixture of truth and falsehood. Yeah. And, and you go through in your book why this myth is perpetuated and how we can actually uh, defend mm -hmm. the truth in light of this mythology. Absolutely. And so, of course, it's called the Copernican principle. So you'd think, okay, well, it's based on Copernicus. Copernicus is the, uh, the scientist who wrote the book uh, on the revolution of the heavenly spheres in 1543, in which he proposed kind of mathematically that, in fact, you can you understand the movement of the moon and the sun and the, and the planets better if you think of the earth as another one of the planets with the moon rotating around us and the earth rotating on its axis, and the movement of the sun then is just merely apparent, whereas we're one of the planets that's actually orbiting the sun. And he said, actually, this makes the movements make more sense than the previous idea, the pre-Copernican idea called the uh, Aristotelian Ptolemaic view, which is that the earth is this sort of stationary center and all the other, everything else that we see literally kind of goes around us. Um, and so the Copernican principle, the myth, is that, well, what Copernicus discovered is that we're not in the center, that is, we're not in the important part of the universe, we're just a mere planet. And so what Copernicus did, he cast us into this position of mediocrity. Science has continued for several centuries. Every new scientific discovery just relegates us to a less and less important place. Okay, so that's the myth. But if you actually look at the history of science, that story appears in the 19th century. Uh, not in the 1500s or the 1600s. The reason is because it completely gets the details wrong about what the pre-Copernican cosmology was. Anybody that knows Aristotle uh, is going to know that Aristotle's physics, the Earth wasn't in the center because that was the important place to be. It's because it's one of the elements. It's the heavy element. That's where stuff falls. And so you're going to get the heavy Earth in the center, it's really the bottom of the universe, but it's also where death and decay are. It's where the detritus of the universe collects. The really important stuff is in the moon and above, it's made of this quintessence of this fifth element of uh, this kind of perfect, eternal, immutable matter that's separate from the earth. And so um, it wasn't that the center was a sort of position of pride of place. Um, and then if you, you, know, you take Dante's Christian interpretation of that, you read the Divine Comedy, the surface of the earth is where humans live. We can die, right? We can ascend to the heavens. But 
we might also we might go to hell. And if you're reading the Divine Comedy and you get to hell, well, the center of the universe, the center of the earth, that's Satan, right? That's the real. That's uh, the center of the universe in the kind of Christianized pre-Copernican cosmology. So, in other words. Um, the center of the universe for Copernicus was not the most important place to be. Um, and it's only by reinterpreting that and counting on people not to understand the history that they could think that, oh, when Copernicus told us we weren't in the center of the universe, that meant we were or were unimportant. Uh, it, it's a terrible kind of uh, bungling of the details of science. C.S. Lewis wrote a wonderful book describing all this called The Discarded Image. Um, and, and so if you read Copernicus and then later Galileo, Galileo actually says, you know, he thinks being a planet, we're reflecting the light of the sun. Um, and that that's a that's a kind of glorious thing. And then Kepler realized later that actually because we move and we're not stationary, there will be a way for us to figure out the distances to some stars using a parallax measurement in trigonometry, which we actually did. So we we're able to measure the distances to some stars just based upon their slight movement um, it's six months uh, later. So we're on one side of the Earth, or the sun, and we measure a star where it is on the sky and then measure it again six months later when you're on the other side of the sun. And if there's a slight variation with some trigonometry, you can figure out how far away that, that star is. So there's so much wrong with the Copernican myth. Nothing wrong with Copernicus and what he discovered, but he did not show us that we are insignificant by moving us from the so-called center. And there's nothing, the actual discoveries of science have not done that either. Yeah, the universe is a lot larger than maybe we imagined or realized, um, but that that doesn't answer the question that we're, we're most interested in, which is that the, the significance of us here, both as creatures, uh, living creatures, but also as discoverers. If you ask the question the right way, you get a very different answer. Yeah, I mean, this is very important to you. You devoted chapter 12 and 13 to eight principles that discredit this mm. idea of mediocrity. But yeah. you, you, you also mentioned something, I, I, and I want you to make a pitch here, if you would. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something a number of times throughout the podcast, and it was, if you read, yeah, if you read this, if you read that, if you read this, Make a pitch for reading again in our generation. Do you think that's even possible? I, it's certainly possible, and I'm you know I'm optimistic about the, the fact what I have seen. And so, just as the education system generally keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse, there's also pockets of light. I mean, there are amazing uh, private schools, there are homeschool co-ops that we've been part of, the classical. Uh, school movement is a wonderful development. The really good classical schools are actually designed around uh, reading primary texts and help forcing kids uh, not to listen to hour-long lectures, but to have to synthesize and articulate and analyze text. You can only be good at that if you learn to read, you learn to read deeply, are able to synthesize, and you're able to focus for long periods of time. And so I think that that's how we renew the culture is by preserving and uh, and renewing and recovering those habits, which were just the kind of basic thing that everybody got that was educated uh, until a century or two ago. It's easy to notice all the stuff that's collapsing and easy not to notice these sort of pockets of light. We've been blessed to have been part of several of those movements and so seeing what it does to kids. Uh, but honestly, think anyone that's listening to us that has kids or has grandkids, if it's in your power, make sure that they have those kinds of educational options. They need to know the truths of the faith, truths of the creeds. They need to know the scriptures like the back of their hand, but they also need intellectual habits. They need discernment. They need the ability to focus and to read and to pay attention. Without those skills, none of this other stuff's going to work. As we're doing this podcast, we're in the midst of an election cycle, and I've often mm -hmm. said that the ballot box is necessary. Um, however, uh, our culture is being determined by far more than the ballot box. I mean, we have the educational institutions, which are broken. Uh, we have the environmental institutions, mm -hmm. which are corrupt. Uh, we have the entertainment industry, which yep. is seducing our culture in many, many different ways. 
Uh, talk about that for a moment. Uh, I mean, this is really where the battle is won or lost. It absolutely is. And as you know, I mean, I'm, I'm here in Washington, D.C., and I'm aware of how much the so-called deep state, but just the administrative state, which no one ever, no one ever elects uh, uh, rules and, and policies that are implemented by all of these agencies in Washington, D.C., and almost all the power is there. But remember, there was another time about 2000 years ago, the most the largest and most powerful empire, Rome, uh, that spanned the known world at the time. Um, that was the moment in which Christianity was born and it was Christians were persecuted and yet they overcame it um, <laughs> and in fact, uh, uh, eventually overtook it. And so there's no reason that we cannot have the same thing again. It's tempting. If you have a narrow time horizon, you might think, oh, nothing like this has ever happened. Actually, this is exactly how it started. Uh, we at least have the benefit of 2,000 years of Christian history to draw on. But I do think that we should think of ourselves much more like those early Christians. Uh, and we should steel ourselves to be prepared uh, to fight and to suffer, just like those early Christians did, if we if we uh, want to be uh, part of uh, transforming the world with the gospel, uh, just as those early Christians did. I'm thinking as you're speaking about Jonathan Wells, I just did a mm -hmm. uh, a tribute to him and replayed a uh, re-aired uh, with, with some augmentation um, uh, one of the podcasts I did with Jonathan Wells. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we talked about suffering. Uh, yeah. You know, when you take the stands that you take as an intellectual, mm -hmm. as an educator, as a commentator, as a writer, you do pay a price. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the reality is I was talking to my younger daughter yesterday. We were talking about these things. And I thought, and she realized this. She's a senior in college now at the University of Dallas. And she sort of realized, you know, if you were going to play it safe, you would have taken the opposite positions, <laughs> all of your public positions, you should have taken the other side. Um, and, and we were trying to figure out again, why, why is it that some people decide that, okay, well, I'm going to pay the price. And I said, it might be a neurodiversity for all I know. We don't care what people think about us, but it, it's also a kind of matter of priority. Are we more interested in the truth, even if it's costly, or are we interested in um, the approval of men and, and accolades? Jonathan Wells was someone that lived his life he, uh, for decades as someone that just was willing to sacrifice for the truth. Um, he did it in his, his own way in the 60s, spent time uh, in the Citadel as a Vietnam War protester, and then ended up on, on the other side later uh, politically and theologically. But he, he was convinced that materialism and the Darwinian ideology were uh, a poison and a toxin to our culture, and he was willing to uh, dedicate the last decades of his life to fighting it. And it's um, it's hard to see that he's gone, uh, but he, he lived a rich life in which he was a stalwart defender of the truth as he saw it. Yeah, and I, I, I love the way he did it. I was listening through that podcast again myself before we re-aired it, and I asked him about a couple of people who are very erudite, very sophisticated intellectuals, and I said, how can they say this or that or the other thing? And he, he basically pointed to what we're talking about right now. He said, well, you know, if you don't say that, you got to re remember there is a, a huge price to be paid. There absolutely is. And, you know, people think, oh, well, of course, in middle school, you know, th th there's a kind of herd instinct for kids. But, oh, man, the academia is is absolutely terrible. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're all social creatures. We're all tempted by intellectual orthodoxies and social contagions. Uh, and we need to all pray both for the discernment to be able to separate the truth from falsehood, but also the um, the bravery and the, will the, the courage to be willing to to first see the truth and and then actually hold to it and to defend it, even if it's costly to us. What's the anthropic principle and what's its relevance to what we were talking about earlier when we we're talking about mediocrity? Well, so the anthropic principle, the basic idea is that you should expect to see conditions compatible with your existence. So in other words, um, if, if um, the conditions required for life are very precise and narrow, then you shouldn't expect to find yourself in just any old kind of circumstance. You should expect to find yourself in those kind of narrow set of conditions. 
uh, because there's no other, if it were different, you wouldn't be able to see yourself. So that's the basic idea is that you have to take account of the, it's kind of a selection effect. So if you need to be around a yellow dwarf star uh, in order to be an organism, then that's where you're going to find yourself. And so we have to take account of that when we're, when we're developing these arguments. Um, on the other hand, people will flip this and say, well, why is it that um, we see these things? And they'll say, well, uh, because we had to see it this way, because if it, if we weren't in these environments, we wouldn't sort of see it. But the question isn't, why do we observe a local environment or a universe compatible with our existence? The question is, why does such a universe exist? That's the question. Uh, it, we shouldn't be surprised, for instance, to discover that we're in a habitable part of the galaxy, but why there are galaxies with habitable regions um, why those habitable regions are also the best places for doing science. Those are the questions that we're actually interested in answering. And so people will often use a kind of legitimate aspect of the anthropic principle that, yeah, take account of these selection effects to try to explain away what is otherwise clear evidence of design. And so um, that's a serious mistake. So as, as you know, we, we spend a lot of time in the book just, just slicing the baloney thinly enough so that people see these differences. One of the ways you explain away uh, the significance, the fine tuning of the universe is through the multiverse mm -hmm. uh, theory. W w w what's yeah. your take on that? That's the that's the kind of main escape hatch. So if you get to a very strong evidence for very precise fine tuning of the universe, then somebody will say, well, maybe the universe is kind of like just as we're around one planet and there's lots of other planets. So yeah, we're around, we're in a universe compatible with our existence, but maybe there are an infinite number of different universes. And we, of course, just happen to be in this one. So then uh, you can say, so we shouldn't be surprised to see the universe that's compatible with our existence, but we also shouldn't be surprised because if there's an infinite set of universes, then you know at least some of them will be compatible with life. Well, now what's happening here is it's an illicit intellectual move because basically what you're saying is um, something that looks like it's designed, uh, this very much looks like it's designed, but we're going to, we're going to invoke sort of other opportunities for chance to operate that we have no independent evidence of. So it'd be like if I, somebody flip a coin 50 times and I did flip 50 heads in a row and I only flipped it 50 times, you say, okay, that's got to be a trick coin. You say, well, no, because I mean, you know, there are infinite number of universes and an infinite number of people flipping coins someplace um, somebody's going to get 50 heads in a row. Nobody would buy that because the much better explanation is that you've got a two-headed coin or that you've cheated. In the same way, um, <laughs> it just is sort of invoking these things without evidence. In the same way, we don't have any independent evidence that those universes exist. So they're not anything like the evidence we have of other planets. Um, and so to me, it's just quite clearly an attempt to explain away what would otherwise be prima facie evidence of design. Uh, and, you know, and my sense is that, look, if you've got to invoke an infinite number of unobservable universes to explain the fine tuning of this universe, that to me is a sign that you're sort of, <laughs> there's something wrong with your worldview. <laughs> or you've lost the argument. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so I got to ask you about this, uh, aliens. Yeah. You know, I, I, I note, I, I remember when uh, Tucker Carlson was on Fox, mm -hmm. he used to have segments on, on yeah. UFOs. And I, 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 I noticed an interview with former President Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he'll be the next president, I don't know. But uh, he was asked about this question, and he said, well, I really don't believe in you. something to the effect, yes. I don't really believe in the UFOs, but uh, some very smart people I know do. Uh, what, yeah. what, what's your take on UFOs? Well, I mean, it, so there's two questions. The, 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 the broader question is, is there life elsewhere in the universe, whether we can detect it or not, right? And I just... My answer is always, we don't really know. And God could have done things a lot of different ways. So let's just sort of be open to it. I don't think there's anything wrong with a SETI researchers looking at radio signals. And I think you could get an intelligent signal and we'd be able to tell. That would be interesting. UFOs, at least as they're normally understood, are that these are sort of advanced technologies of beings kind of like ourselves coming from other star systems and visiting us. Again, I mean, it, now, based on our current knowledge of physics, it's not clear how travel like that could even, it would work, but I also think it's possible there's some fundamental things we don't understand yet that we'll discover later. And so I think that we should just sort of be open to evidence, but that we should also be uh, discerning. And so um, 
it's even if, I mean, Hank, I'll tell you, this is kind of where I am at the moment. I have talked to people that uh, have in, have had ex alien abduction experiences. That is, at least they explain it. What they believe happened is that these aliens abducted them and conducted um, experiments on them and then put them back in their beds or something like this. And I've read a lot about this. This is a very widely attested experience of people encountering, having an experience with other beings that can be quite negative. But if you think about it, okay, that way of describing these encounters is an artifact of the 20th century when we started having ideas about, you know, spaceships and little green men and things like that. But that might simply be an interpretive grid of a spiritual encounter that people have been having since time immemorial. And I can tell you one woman I talked to at a conference, I was absolutely convinced she believed she had been abducted. Um, I wasn't going to talk her out of it being aliens from another planet, but I had a very strong feeling that what she had encountered was a was hostile spiritual forces, which she had was interpreting in this particular way. And so I, I have a feeling that a lot of these reports actually have something uh, to do with that. And because we have so stripped our, our cosmology and our understanding of reality so that maybe people have the idea that there's a God, but we forget that there can also be all, there all the Bible talks about all sorts of other spiritual beings that are part of God's created order, some of which are good and some of which are bad. And it's like that category has dropped out. And the only thing we have now is aliens on spaceships to account for these experiences. Uh, and I think, okay, be, yeah, be open to the evidence for that one way or the other. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical. But I think we also need to realize that actually Christians have metaphysical resources for explaining a lot of these experiences people have. And it may just be that in a materialistic age, people are having encounters with spiritual beings and they're interpreting them best they can as aliens from another planet. What do you make of the hype in recent years about UAPs, unidentified uh, aerial hmm. phenomena? Sort well, and related. so there, yeah, there's some, there are some of this, these cool um, video footage that the Navy has released um, of weird things on radars. And I'm sure a lot of uh, folks listening have seen these videos. Now, of course, if they're aliens in spacecraft, that would be easy to confirm. I mean, it's like Independence Day. If we get a spaceship right over ahead here, we're going to know, okay, there's aliens. But it's always these kind of distant things that are open to multiple interpretations. And so there's there are definitely some weird things happening, uh, but it's not at all dispositive. It's not nowhere near strong enough, I think, to persuade skeptics. Um, and, and at this point, I think I'm just skeptical enough of the government that when they start releasing this stuff, I'm thinking, what are they trying to distract us from? It's like, what are, what are they doing? And they want us to start thinking about aliens. Um, and, and so again, it's always just like kind of right on the, uh, the edge. And so at least at the moment, we've not gotten any evidence that I think would persuade uh, a skeptic, nor should it. So I just really do think that, that this, is, this stuff's just still an open question. So a lot of people are taking your book, The Privileged Planet, and saying this book is a science stopper. Hmm. Your response? Well, it's weird to argue that a book that argues that science itself is built into things, that not just life, but scientific discovery is built into the structure of the universe. How exactly that is a science stopper, anti-science is a mystery to me, because we're arguing that science has a, a, an intrinsic dignity and value in the scheme of things, but science ought to be about um, viewing and analyzing and discovering the universe as it is and following the evidence where it leads, not assuming ahead of time that the universe can't point beyond itself. And I think when people think, okay, well, anyone that argues that the universe had purpose, um, if, if they're saying that's anti-science, it's because they have confused science and its right uh, definition with scientific materialism. But those are those are two different things. We talked a little earlier about reading, uh, cultivating the art and science of reading, the, the habit of reading. Uh, you, you talk about uh, cultivating the skill of reading the book of nature. Yes. And th that's, that's really a big part of what you're talking about when you talk about the privileged planet. You're talking about the awe and the integrity that comes from learning or cultivating the habit of reading the book of nature. 
That's right. And, and we talked about Psalm 19, the heavens, the glory of God, uh, the, declare the glory of God. And of course, Paul in Romans 1, it says, from the foundation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. That's a powerful claim. That's a strong claim that we can know clearly from the things God has made something about his nature uh, and invisible qualities. Uh, not just that, oh, the universe looks like it might be purposeful, but we actually can know something about God. And this traditional theological idea that, that just as there's a book of scripture, there's a book of nature, press that metaphor a little bit. Well, what is a book? Well, if you open a book, if you know how to read a book, you you don't attend to the text. It's like if you're focusing on the font size or the color of the ink, you're almost certainly not attending to the meaning of the text. If you're reading a book, the, those symbols become the, the means by which you read through the text to the meaning of its author so that the intentions of the author are being transmitted to your mind by way of this physical object. That's what it means to read that kind of book. In the same way, if we press the metaphor, the book of nature is a book. We have to learn how to read it. What, what are its symbols? What is the language in which it's written? But then if we genuinely learn to read it, we too should be able to read through it to the intentions of its authors. So that the world is not just something, the kind of playpen that God has, has created for us to live. It's actually it's his general revelation of himself, uh, uh, and he leaves it to us to learn, to follow the clues, and to learn how to read it. But if we read it properly, we will read through it, and we will see that it points beyond itself to him. As we bring the podcast to a close, I want to read something from your book and then ask you to comment on it. Um, and, and this is um, a step in opening uh, one's mind to an almost unforgettable. Uh, uh, almost forgotten possibility, but, but, but this is what you write. Thus does our inquiry reduce to a single question. Could this immense symphonic system of atoms, fields, forces, stars, galaxies, people, and a planet called Earth has sprung not from some inscrutable outworking of blind necessity, or an inexplicable accident, but instead from a choice and a purpose. And if so, then surely there could be evidence to suggest as much. Absolutely. That's the, that is, is our conclusion, is our plea for people, not that we don't want to bowl people over, but if we're genuinely interested in the question of whether there's purpose to the universe, if there's a God. The question isn't, okay, well, God needs to prove it to me. The, the, the proper approach should be, how do I dispose myself and open myself so that if there is a God and there is a purpose uh, to the world, I will be able to see it? That's, I think, the, the, the true mark of wisdom in the 21st century. Do you anticipate any future... Uh, and I'm talking about this in a specific mm -hmm. sense, any future discoveries in astronomy that might significantly support your hypothesis of the privileged planet? Yeah, I mean, we're uh, the next generation of telescopes we hope will uh, help us, uh, enable us to be able to detect Earth-sized planets. We're not quite there yet. Guillermo is actually working uh, in industry, actually, uh, in that area now. We're not there yet, but I mean, that's going to bear very directly on our argument. We'll detect probably tens of thousands of extrasolar planets, and and we hope eventually Earth-sized planets. And so that's going to that's going to kind of narrow the field and, and winnow the possibilities. And so we hope maybe in ten years or fifteen years, we'll be able to give some really specific numbers to these things. Where at the moment it's just kind of wide error bars on both sides. I want you to help me to do something as we close the podcast, and that is uh, convince people to get a copy of the book and 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 maybe some uh, may, maybe some advice on how to use the book. I mean, a lot of people mm -hmm. look at a book this big and say this is beyond no. my ability. <clears throat> I, you know, I, I I I may have said this many years ago, but but this book is actually enjoyable to read. Uh, talk about how you can best facilitate using this book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think it is a good <laughs> book often for um, uh, book clubs in which you take a chapter 
uh, a week or a month uh, for a lot of people. Uh, of course, lots of science people have no problem with it. Um, but you can also watch the documentary back in 2004. I mean, we look a lot younger. Um, you can find it actually free online. I think it's also on Netflix and Amazon, which is a you know, 59 minute summary of the argument. Um, but honestly, anyone that, that's listened to our uh, conversation is going to get the gist of the book. Uh, but the book itself is where the details are. If people wonder why it's expensive or why it's so thick, um, in part, it's because it's packed with illustrations and figures. And I, there are also 20 pages of color plates in it. Um, but we wanted there to be, you know, it to be one place uh, where all of these arguments uh, could be found. And we're just really thankful for the publisher to allow us to do that because, it, you know, it's hard these days to persuade a publisher to put lots of illustrations, especially color illustrations in a book. But we're really pleased with the way it turned out. Again, it is a fantastic book. Uh, it's the 20th anniversary edition of The Privileged Planet, How Our Place in the Cosmos is Designed for Discovery. And uh, it is available for all of those who stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can get your copy on the web at equip.org, E-Q-U-I-P dot org, or you can write me at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. Again, uh, when you listen to the podcast, you are going to be blessed in so many ways uh, because the people that I interview are interesting, informative, and inspirational, and you're the quintessential example of that, Jay. Uh, I, I so appreciate you. Uh, thanks so much for the contributions you're making. Your life is making a difference for not only time, but for eternity. Thanks so much, Hank. So good to be with you. Yeah, it was great to be with you as well. And if you enjoy the podcast, subscribe, rate, review. It helps a lot. Thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast. Look forward to seeing you next time with more.